Hi, everyone. I'm Bryony Fair. I'm Professor of Art History at University College London, and I've just curated a show, Forms of Life, uh, Hilmer of Clinton, Pete Mondrian. Hi, I'm Julia Voss, and I'm an art historian and curator, and I've written the biography of Hilma Afklint called Hilma Afklint, A Biography. From David Zwerner, this is Dialogues, a podcast about artists and the way they think. She's a time traveler, or the work is a form of time travel, I feel, that's interesting in itself. The idea is actually that we are encouraged to connect with things and then transform and then connect again and then transform again. It's actually something, it's repetitive. It's like the spiral. It, it's a procedure that's being done over and over again. I'm Helen Molesworth, your host for this season. Every episode features a conversation with artists, curators, writers, designers, philosophers, filmmakers, and musicians about what it means to make things today. Hey, everyone. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since I read Julia Voss's biography of Helma Afklint. Afklint is an artist who has totally captured the public imagination, and she continues to challenge our conventional ideas about the history of 20th century art, especially when it comes to thinking about abstraction, time, and mysticism. I called up the art historian Bryony Fair to join me and Julia as we discuss the complex legacy of Hilma Af Klint. Thanks for listening. One of the things I thought we might start with is a, a kind of large question, and I, I pose it to both of you, and it is, for each of you, what has been the most challenging part of thinking about Hilma Af Klint within our current art historical framework. Julia, I wonder if you might like to might like to start. I think once you've started um uh, researching and thinking about Hema Upland, you'll you'll never stop and you always discover new things. I think what was the biggest shift for me is maybe to accept that she actually really believed in higher forces and voices that she would communicate with and be in dialogue with, and that these forces really helped her to shape her work. I remember when I started researching her, I sort of hoped as an, you know, as a trained art historian, that it would turn out that this was kind of overdone before, and that people maybe sort of had this preconception of her and it would turn out that she was actually, you know, a kind of classical avant-garde artist who would think about the art around her, the art of the past, and sort of from this shape uh, an art of the future. But actually, I learned Swedish in order to read her notebooks. Um, and what I realized pretty quickly, it's, it's not overdone. It's all over. And she has these voices and they have names. Some of them have Christian names like Gregor, Amalie, um, or Georg, there's a Buddhist name, there's Ananda that speaks to her. And they, they keep speaking to her until her old age, until, you know, her last years. And then there are even, there are also dead people speaking to her, friends that have died, Dr. Steiner also after he has died. So in the beginning I was, I was a bit scared of that. And I also had the fear that maybe this would in a way make it difficult to see her as someone who has really shaped that body of work. And then when I, the more I understood it, the more I found out that it's actually, it's not a relationship that is commissioning her. So it's not like she's receiving order and then she just executes what other, other you know, entities want her to do, but it's actually a dialogue. And once this opened up, that this is a dialogue and that they are sort of their messages traveling back and forth and she's kind of cooperating with these forces, I, I don't know, I started really, really enjoying that. And I find, it, I find it a big liberation that I can now look at these forces, enjoy them and follow them. And I don't have to, you know, I don't feel like I have to explain them away. I don't have to downgrade them. I don't have to turn them into something else or translate them. 
they were there for Hilma of Clint and I can accept that and I can actually quite enjoy that. I think that was the biggest shift for me. And I have some questions about that further on and that I'm going to ask you. Uh, I thought we would take, I didn't realize you would come out of the gate with that so strong. That's marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Bryony, you just organized this show at the Tate. What were the big, um, what were the changes for you? What, what, what does she make possible mm. or she displays? Mm. Well, this is quite uh, a long journey, if you will, because I've worked on abstraction the whole of my life, not only as an art historian, but I have loved abstraction all of my life. And I guess as an art historian, particularly from the 80s on, you know, I felt what was really important for me was to save abstraction from mysticism. Okay. So that Morris Tuckman show was, for me, deeply conservative. You're saying the Morris Tuckman is the, the spirit, spirituality and art. The is, spiritual and art show. Right. And, you know, At in LACMA some way. in the 80s, yeah. and it's the first yeah, place yeah. where Hillman's work appears. Yeah. So, Brian, yeah. please go on. Yeah. And in some ways, you know, it, it was the break. It introduced Hilma of Clint on an international stage. But in other ways, of course, it completely confirmed a very long, long, history of thinking about abstraction in purely idealist terms. You know, the idea that this was a transcendental art form does not start there. You know, it goes right back to the very beginning. And of course, many of these artists themselves were deeply interested in transcendental ideas, you know. But I felt, along with many other people writing and kind of committed to abstraction at that time, that you know, in a way, one had to kind of seize the chance to think differently about abstraction as a materialist practice, you know, not only to reduce it to, you know, there's a lot of the writing from these artists themselves with it that seemed like a powerful way of them figuring out what the hell they'd actually done, you know, what they'd made, you know, rather than just the playing out the kind of resolution of these ideas. You know, what is, you know, of course, the most important thing about art is that it questions what you think you know. And slowly, slowly that, I mean, it is definitely not that I have come to accept and embrace mysticism, far from it. But I think that sense of, particularly in relation to Hilma as Clint, thinking about how this artist came to make the body of work that she did you know, has really made me, you know, not just invited, but kind of forced me to, you know, re-describe, rethink some of the assumptions that I had. And I think in some ways, if we expand, you know, what we think we do as art historians, you know, to consider a, a much larger image world and to think, you know, why would we not think of her work as art. I mean, you know, whether she was intending it as um, easel painting in the conventional sense, I think not. But, you know, that sense of having to expand our sense of what abstraction can entail and also the way in which she was thinking, the way in which she was compulsively searching through making, that says a lot about the creative process, what it means to make art or to make a body of work in the way that she did. And I think what she did opens on to particularly a set of contemporary conditions and questions around the planetary and the environmental in ways that are really interesting and important. So I, the, in answer to your question, it's been quite a long journey, but in one sense, it's a continual process of questioning what you think you know. So that's what art does. Then Helmut of Clint is really important for me. Indeed. And I guess, Bryony, I want to start with you, but then also turn this question back to Julia as well, because I'm, I mean, Bryony, you're coming to us from London and Julia from Berlin. I'm sitting in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, 
there is much talk of things spiritual. Um, and I think there has been a kind of spiritual turn in American culture, kind of in general. There's a, a shift away from religion. Most people don't describe themselves now as religious, but as spiritual. There have been many articles about this recently. And I feel quite implicated. I am not outside of this. I'm an ideological subject. I, too, entertain thoughts I didn't used to. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you, Bryony, is um, you said, you know, I, 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 you wanted to save abstraction from the mystical and you wanted to think about it as, you said, a materialist practice. And I wonder if you could just say what it was that needed saving from mysticism. What is it about mysticism that we find as art historians mm. so anxiety producing? Mm. And then what? What do you mean by a materialist practice as well? Mm. Well, that's a, a really obviously important and vital question. I struggle with that. And I think in a way, what I, I also really struggle with is the way in which certain ways of thinking about art in terms of how it expresses mystical and transcendental ideas is that art is seen as a kind of vehicle for higher knowledge. And in some ways, it's a refusal of the experience that art is as simply presenting us with an image that has been made, you know, that has been physically made and what that means. I think it's important that for me anyway, this return to the spiritual or, you know, the set of ideas that might attach to that term, I'm kind of interested in what travels under that name, as it were, rather than trying to define or fix the meaning of the work in such higher um, ideas or experiences. It seems to me that the, the work of art actually has a transformatory effect on us. We can describe that in many different ways, but for me, it's really important not to see the artwork as merely the vehicle for something else, but that the experience of art or the body of work that an artist produces is in itself a form of knowledge production. And by that, I don't simply actually mean scientific knowledge or rational sense of what knowledge is, but actually much more subtle relationship to our environment, to human experience, to the struggles of what it means to be human. All of that can be incorporated, whatever you choose to call it. But I'm very keen to maintain a sense that art itself and what artists do is a powerful vector for this rather than in a way take the the intentions of the artist in this case Hilma of Clint that felt that she was a, a kind of channel for spiritual voices or spiritual guides I mean I don't think we need to believe that any more than we need to believe perhaps any of the religious meanings that underpinned, you know, for example, a history of Western art, you know, it doesn't follow that we have to be believers. What art does, I think, has a separate role, is a, a very powerful form of knowledge for us and, and a necessary form of understanding the world that we inhabit. Julia, you too, uh, in your beginning, remarks expressed a kind of anxiety around mysticism that you've made a piece with through writing this book about Off Clint. And I, I wonder what you think the this anxiety about the mysticism or the seance is. Yeah, I think this is really <laughs> this is really spot on. And I think sort of my anxiety comes from the suspicion that if there's mysticism and um, higher forces, there might, it might be kind of a borrowed authority with which you speak. 
Um, and there might not be the chance to disagree or see diff things differently, but it's like, you know, it's set. It's like, it comes from above and you have to accept it. But I think exactly what, what you said about sort of our experiences with the spiritual, I think it has changed a lot. Um, and it's very different from the religious. I mean, the religious is something I think of as being controlled by the church, by a certain hierarchy, and that is kind of fixed and doesn't leave much room for the individual. The kind of spiritual we are all now practicing is something very open. It's sort of joyful, playful, curious. You know, we don't, we do yoga. I would even count Harry Potter in that, you know, we read these books um, and we enjoy it as, you know, as an experience, but also as something, as a narration, as a story. And I think this is where Hilma of Clint comes in. I mean, the nice things about her dialogue with the spirits is that actually there's no point where she wants us to believe in those spirits. She never says, you know, this is what Ananda has told me and you also have to listen to Ananda. Actually, I mean, this is sort of the kind of root, how it comes to her, but it doesn't sort of now the pictures are there and, and we are supposed to look at the pictures. We are not supposed to be in touch with Ananda, Gregor or Georg. Um, and also she throughout her life she keeps sort of saying that she's kind of baffled by what she has done so so it never it never turns into something that is fixed um and i don't think the idea is that sort of the fixed system is being you know abolished and then replaced by another fixed system the idea is actually that we are encouraged to connect with things and then transform and then connect again, and then transform again. It's actually something, it's repetitive. It's like the spiral. It, it's a procedure that's being done over and over again. And even in, in the large paintings, the, the, the 10 largest, sort of the very last painting looks very ordered in contrast to the other ones. But you can see that these two little figures and they're swirling again as if they're starting the process all over new. And I think that, and that's... That's the anxiety. The anxiety is that sort of if there's mysticism, we have suddenly we again have to accept priests and authorities and hierarchies and, you know, and we are being told what to feel, what to see and, and so forth. And I think that's exactly what Hilma of Clint is not doing. And that's something, you know, that helped me to, to even enjoy it. And I think also it's for writing about it, it's, it's a bit like, you know, these, these novels of magic realism where you have people that are on the one hand taking part in life and they have you know they they have a family and they travel and they have telephones and they have movies you know and they have modernism around them but at the same time there are sort of strange things happening and that's that's him often I don't see her as this kind of I mean I see her as a mystic but I don't see her as some sort of recluse that doesn't interact with the world she does both at the same time and that's that's beauty. That was definitely one of the things that I came away with after reading your biography. And also just in case it slipped by early on, kudos to you for learning Swedish. Thank you. <laughs> I had a brilliant Swedish teacher here in Berlin. One of the things that I'm, that I'm curious about, um, I often think about the relationship between athletes and artists. They engage in enormous amounts of practice so that they can be prepared for um, indeterminacy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, the, it, um, it, you know, there's this incredible relationship between rigor and repetition and then improvisation. And, and athletes, contemporary athletes, most of them immediately upon winning, thank God. And I've always found this to be like very disappointing. Like, why do you thank, why do you displace your own labor, this own extraordinary achievement, you, your body, your sensibility, your sense of timing and touch, you know, that allows you to do this thing. And then you, you immediately deflect and you thank this higher being. But I wonder, listening to both of you this morning, is if part of Hilma's um, sense that she is this mediumistic person and that these directions or prompts come from elsewhere is partly her own ambivalence around her own in 
intention. And of course, we as art historians, our generation of art historians is profoundly skeptical of statements of artistic intention. I, I, we've been taught to view such statements with great suspicion and with great measure. And here we have someone saying, hey, man, it's all like, I got nothing. This, I'm, I won't make a statement of intention. I'm deflecting. I think ambivalence is absolutely the word. I mean, I feel that that's so generative for F. Clint as an artist. Here yeah. is somebody working. I mean, the level of production, both in terms of the painting she painted, the drawings she drew, the writing she wrote. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's what artists do in that sort of every day. The, the life of the work and the life of work is so intense. And I feel that in some ways to me, these kind of spiritual exercises or the diaristic form, even, you know, a lot of the drawings and paintings, they're dated. It's kind of, you know, it, it takes the form of a spiritual diary or spiritual exercises but it also is almost kind of giving her license. I always feel that the voices are kind of giving permission, you know, in some ways. It, it's what enables a, a woman artist working at a certain historical moment under very many constraints of what an artist can do, especially a woman artist. And there you have these voices kind of allowing you, having permission, actually even giving you permission not to kind of even erase the, you know, where you've drawn in pencil. And, you know, it allows her to do things that now we find intensely interesting in terms of a, a work of a picture, you know, or a work of, of painting. But actually, she was given license almost to get it down, to have these kind of large areas of flat color, presumably because, you know, as a recording instrument, you know, she's seeing herself as something like a kind of radio, you know, she's kind of, and I think that relationship to technology and, you know, just the, the kind of power of what it allows her accounts for some of the incredibly what seems so ex these experimental aspects of the work that she made and surely that must have been exciting for her as an artist as well because you're on this kind of frontier and here's an artist who's you know trained academically in terms of the conventions of 19th century painting being allowed somehow to do something, you know, to be in a kind of, you know, a radically different kind of terrain that's partly a kind of scenography for her cosmic journey. I mean, that's kind of thrilling and that comes across, obviously, in the paintings. Mm. Julia, I've your biography does a beautiful job of situating off Clint in what I would call like a very thick network of technological advances. I mean, you you talk about the telephone, the x-ray, the discovery that the atom is not indivisible, but in fact can be divisible. Marie Curie accepts a Nobel Prize in, in Hilma's lifetime, in Hilma's country. So your book really, in some ways, situates her as an artist within a scientific revolution. Um, and then also, of course, she's getting messages from the other side to make what she calls astral paintings. And I wonder, one, um, how or if you felt the need to square those two things, but two, also um, to pick up on something Bryony is talking about, like, do you see her as like, riding slipstream on those technological or scientific revolutions as a, as a way of granting herself permission to make the pictures she wants to make. Ah, here, here we are again uh, with the question of intention, right? And the, you know, the entire question of how much psychology do we allow us to, um, to be put into the story? And I'm, 
I'm kind of wary of putting too much psychology into that because I feel like down the line is, uh, you know, Oliver Sacks or sort of claiming that Hildegard of Bingen, for example, had schizophrenia, you know, and sort of trying to transform what she actually describes quite vividly in her notebooks into something else, into an expression of something else. You know, I don't, I'm not saying I'm completely against it. I just thought I, I don't want to do it. I, you know, on the other hand, I am an historian and I'm also a historian of science, art historian, historian of science. So I'm interested in all the things that surround her. Um, and there are many factors that sort of shaped her. One is, I think, the revolutions she saw in science happening. The others were, you know, like real revolutions happening, and she even refers to them. I mean, she refers to the first Russian revolution. She sees that sort of in close by Finland, the women suddenly get um, the right to vote. Then there's the Russian revolution. There are two world wars she lives through. She sees sort of democracy coming. I mean, there are a lot of things that are happening. And also what's also important, I mean, she's surrounded by this collective of spirits that talk to her, but she's also surrounded by a real collective of women that work with her and, and build this world really with her. I mean, they, um, at some point they even move outside Stockholm and they are on this island and they, I think they had a lot of liberty in building this world together. And that must be also, must have been also very, very encouraging. I mean, she calls herself the, the instrument of ecstasy. And I think she was not only allowed, she was really fueled by this energy she was surrounded by, which was sometimes, you know, the energy of her friends and lovers, the energy of a time of change, um, and the energy of these strange cosmic beings that chose to support her work. I want to talk about that ecstasy moment for a minute, because I felt a bit adolescent at a certain point reading your biography. I had sort of bought into the myth of Helma, this strange spinster lady painter. <laughs> and when your book made it clear that she indeed had a libido and a body and libidinous relations and that those libidinous relations were with other women, I got all excited and I turned to my wife and I said, this is extraordinary. It turns out Hilma of Klint is, you know, a sapphic sister, a fellow traveler, <laughs> a member of the family, as we say. And I said to my wife, does this change her pictures for you? And my wife, being a Renaissance art historian of great sagacity, oh, wow. said very quickly to me, no. <laughs> and, and I realized when I thought about it, that they didn't change the pictures for me either, but that something had shifted. My idea of what gay culture was got a little bigger. My idea of lesbian identity grew a little bit. But the pictures didn't really change for me, knowing that she had intimate physical and emotional relations with women. And the adolescent part of me was like, wow, how did I get to be this age? And I still cannot figure out, one, what it means to be gay, and two, how to hold the biography and or the identity of the artist in tandem with the objects that said artist produces. And so I guess I just wanted to, to ask both of you, like, how does that piece of information, which is newly brought to us from the biography, change anything for either of you? Did, did either of you have this dilemma? Is there a light bulb go off or did you just, or does it not matter? I'm just so perplexed. I think it changed, changed something for me because, I mean, I, I've always had the feeling that sort of sex is all over the paintings, at least, um, for example, again, the 10 largest, for example, or the big figure paintings. They have a lot of illusions and, you know, there's a lot of mating and inseminating and, you know, fusing and coming together and touching and, you know, there's all kind of physical sensation um, in there, which is beautiful. Yeah. And, and there's a I, lot of bursting and radiating and, yes. you know, that, that kind of thing is happening. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
And I always wondered whether this is a lived experience or, some, or something that becomes so powerful because it, it can only happen on the canvas. Um, and then I was relieved to see that it's a lived experience and not only something that she had, you know, I thought this makes everything even happier for me. If it's lived mm. and they, you know, and there's, that's also nice in the notebooks. It's not like something, I mean, they have all kind of, and I'm sure someone who, who's trained in that could also find more code words than I could because I'm, I, that's the first time I, um, uh, I researched sort of sexual relations in a historical setting. For example, they, yeah, they, they talk of all kind of, they never call them, they never talk about sort of their, they, for example, they wouldn't call themselves lesbians, for example. Right. That's not a word that's coming. They also don't call them queer for obvious reasons. Reasons. Um, um, so they have a whole kind of language they develop in order to sort of describe what's happening between them. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Julia that in the paintings, that sense of the libidinal is so insistently there. But I think the relationship with the biography is, you know, complex. I don't think it's an expression of her sexual life in a direct way. I mean, I think there are different dimensions. There are feminist art historians in Sweden who've looked more recently that, you know, there are several women artists who are queer at the end of the 19th century. You know, Hilma F. Clint is, is not alone. And that sense of, of different lifestyles being a possibility then. I mean, I think there is this historical moment when actually in Stockholm, you know, this is a thing, you know, it's not simply unique to her. And I think that's very important and important, you know, the feminist start history that brings that to, to the fore is extremely important. But I think that there's something about this sense of the visionary that brings this, this, this sense of ecstasy Right. You know, it's not so different from William Blake in some ways. I mean, you know, it is part of that kind of ecstatic tradition where, of course, mind and body are not separated. And I think that kind of idea of the work that she makes, usually in theory, so it's all sort of polymorphic. It's all sort of, you know, one picture morphing into another there's a kind of polymorphic transmutating process continually happening which i think has this sense of a libidinal flow so i think you know the role of biography in julia your book is absolutely phenomenal a really fine biography but i think in relation to the the work that she makes the biography is always you know, part of a constellation of conditions. I don't right. want to, to not see her, her own queer sexuality as a part of what those pictures are, but nor do I want them just to be that because I think they have a life as a kind of living organism that exceeds oh, yeah. that. Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think that's, that's very important. I always think of him out of Clint's work as a sort of building with many entrances mm. and there are many layers. So her work, you know, they're, you know, they, they contain bio, biographical traces, but I would not say that they express these biographical sort of incidents fully. So they contain biographical layers. Um, they have these uh, metaphysical longings. They are, uh, they contain symbols sometimes, but they also con contain uh, diagrams um and you know most importantly she thought of them as portals as portals to something else that would open up to something else and i think particularly the themes you have brought out in your beautiful exhibition on sort of how to relate to nature and how to be able to connect to the world around you is something that is really important to all the paintings so yeah no i would not sort of put this only in the first row absolutely I'm very interested in when when we know what and how we tell 
what is largely we have received art history as a kind of chronological narrative and museums tend to be arranged chronologically like we tend to abide by uh, the march of linear time and we all know that we've attached progress to that and the, that that is not maybe gotten us very very far however with this body of work that we really don't receive until quite late until the 60s and then again the 80s and then again the 2000s right there are these moments of reception um we have this myth that she was somehow isolated and didn't know anything julia's book dispels all those myths and shows her to be a cosmopolitan subject in the world she traveled she knew people she saw things she went to school she was very very aware of what was happening and now Bryony we have you putting her in explicit you know visual dialogue with Mondrian and I'm in print sort of chastising MoMA for just putting one of her paintings in the 1913 gallery as if we all knew about Hilma in 1913 and so I guess my last question is if you were in a museum and had to negotiate where where do we put this material when we tell ourselves the story of either the 20th century abstraction the history of women artists right there's lots of stories as you just said Julia Hilma is a house with many doors well i i would respond to that by well in some ways a a, a very non definitive answer because what of Clint does, of course, is to kind of scramble our ideas of time. The very fact that in a way, she's not just discovered, she's kind of made latterly in a way. I mean, of course, she made the work when she made the work. But I think part of, you know, the first wave of uh, reception of Af Clint, I think we're beyond that now, but was but it's still tenacious, you know, this idea that she was the first abstract artist and that, you know, everything is wrong because she was the very first. And But, I mean, I feel that that pioneer narrative about abstraction is what I've been trying to question from the, from the get-go. And if you follow that, you know, you go back and back, there's Georgiana Houghton, there's, you know, you go back and back and back. But I think the point is that the scrambling of those progressive models of art history is kind of important. The fact that she, as well as many other artists, when the work is interesting, it, it is disruptive of those kinds of chronologies. I mean, we might like to put them in their place, but the way she opens up a problem of temporality, I think. I mean, even the mediumistic, you know, as a trope, the whole idea of the mediumistic kind of is often premised on, you know, loss on those that are, have been lost who return. You know, this is past, present and future are not sitting in their proper place, are they? So I feel that in some ways she is not the only disruptor, but that's just vital and she's a powerful disruptor. And that's what makes the work kind of interesting. So where would I place her? I think I might place her. Actually, I'm inclined to place her in about 1985. In terms of the first framing of one of the 10 largest, you know, when they're first framed, because obviously they were not framed when she made them. There are these, I mean, in a way, I, I want to locate her historically at that kind of fin de siècle moment. I think it is really important for all the reasons that Julia's biography kind of make so vital, you know, that she could not have made what she made unless she was kind of caught in this incredible complex crossfire of art, science, spirituality. But I think that sense of them being made as very large abstract paintings in a frame, particularly the 10 largest cycle, which they were not originally. It's kind of also a sort of pivotal moment, you know, just in case we think she's a, you know, a, an abstract expressionist, avant la lettre, making 
large scale mural sized paintings in a frame. I mean, I think they're more complex in some ways as decorative schemes or, mm. you know, you know, what are they? But I think that way in which she slips through the net and in a way has, you know, says something about the ever evolving, um, historicity and imaginary place of, of the artwork. You know, she's a time traveler or the work is kind of a, is a, is a form of time travel. I feel that's interesting in itself. I think that's so beautiful. That really kind of broke something up open for me that the, that the, that the seance is already the time scrambler, that the work and its reception are somehow already doing something really quite similar. Julia, what do, what do you think, having taken on the yeoman's task of writing a <laughs> beginning, middle, and end kind of book, the hardest book to write? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm in the midst of um, preparing the show on Hilma of Clint and Kandinsky, and I'm doing it together with Daniel Birnbaum. So right now I'm placing her again and again <laughs> next to Kandinsky. And I think actually it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are differences for sure, um, but there are also many similarities, some of them very surprising. I mean, what I find beautiful, for example, is um, apart from the obvious that they're both interested in non-representational art, is that they both had St. George as their heraldic figure. Um, St. George sort of uh, comes up in her paintings in, uh, in, the, uh, in the 1915s. Um, and um, St. George is obviously very important for Kandinsky, who places him on the uh, cover of the uh, Blaue Reiter, Almanach, um, and St. George comes up again and again in Kandinsky. So I would place it against, well, well with Kandinsky. Um, and the other thing is, um, there was this beautiful essay by Alex Russ in The New Yorker on Hildegard of Bingen, which I listened to again and again. I have this sort of, I, I have this app where I can also listen to it. And he called Hildegard of, Ing um, of Bing and she called her an Andy Warhol of a spiritual factory on the Rhine, which I think is just a superb way of expressing it. Um, and I think Hildegard of Bing and, and Hilma of Clint have a lot in common. And, and particularly when it comes, I mean, this sort of this working in a collective um, and um, this working with spiritual forces, but also when it comes to the idea of distribution, this idea that sort of works could be copied and then distributed is, you know, an idea obviously Andy Warhol had, but also an idea Hildegard of Bingen had, but a lot of people in the Middle Ages had. And I think Hilma of Clint would have been happy with uh, this idea too. So having Hildegard of Bingen and Hilma of Clint, maybe Hildegard of being in Skivia's book and Hildegard's uh, and Hilma of Clint in one exhibition, I would find absolutely thrilling. I love this. So you're proposing we 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 put her in the medieval period, and Bryony's proposing we put her in 1985. <laughs> this seems a perfect place to end a conversation about the forever engrossing Hilma of Clint, both in her person. Uh, and perhaps really more than anything, this remarkable body of work that she has left for us. I feel, I don't know, just very, very happy to be um, talking with you both. So Thank uh, you, Helen, for having us. That was a great, great conversation. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was fantastic. Dialogues is produced by David Zwerner. If you like this episode, please follow, rate, and review us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It really does help the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you join us here next time.